You're on, Peter. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm Peter Derman, a minimally invasive and endoscopic spine surgeon at Texas Back Institute, joined by a bunch of my partners and others uh, for tonight. We're going to be speaking, and let me share my screen here. We're going to be speaking about some interesting cases in the realm of endoscopic spine surgery, which is something that has become an increasing and now a majority part of my practice at this point. And so what I wanted to start off with is just a, just a bit of an overview of endoscopic spine surgery in general, as well as the technique. Um, and then we'll go through a series of cases together in which I found that endo endoscopy was particularly beneficial. Love for this to be uh, interactive. So please use the chat box and um, you know the panelists feel free to interrupt me as we go. Um, but just as a, at a high level, the reason that I think uh, endoscopy is so amazing um, is because it really is a departure, a paradigm shift from just doing kind of open surgery through smaller and smaller incisions. And, and what this allows you to do is place the camera within the body um, and really have much less collateral damage and soft tissue morbidity. So for instance, this is a patient of mine. She had a right-sided paracentral disc herniation at L5-S1. I did an interlaminar uh, discectomy on her. And for unrelated reasons, she happened to get an MRI a year or so later, um, which was a cool way for me to check my work and see. And what you can see is the disc herniation is completely gone, but you can't even see the track through which I went. The paraspinal muscles are totally preserved. And that's why patients just bounce back so much quicker. There are two main approaches for um, lumbar endoscopic spine surgery. And what we're talking about here is uh, full endoscopic uniportal um, endoscopy. So there's the interlaminar, which is kind of more intuitive and, and more like a traditional posterior approach. And then there's the transferaminal approach, which is an outside in approach. At a high level, kind of transferaminal is very useful for foraminal and far lateral disc herniations, as you might expect. But at L4-5 and above, when the pelvis is, in, is not in the way, it can be a very, very nice way to get into the canal to even deal with ventral pathology, so disc herniation central and paracentral at any of those levels above. And the nice thing about that is that you don't really have to take any bone at all in, in the majority of the cases. Now at L5-S1, you know, the pelvis is typically in your way from, from going transferaminal, especially if you're trying to get all the way into the canal. But fortunately, there's a big interlaminar window. So usually for canal pathology at L5-S1, I'll go interlaminar. Um, and then for anything else above that, I tend to go transferaminal. Um, as you go up, obviously, there's more shingling of the lamina. And so if you're going interlaminar, um, then you have to, you, it just takes more time. You have to take some bone away and, and you'd prefer not to, if you can avoid it. Obviously, you know, there are, there are exceptions, migrated discs, stenosis, et cetera, but those are kind of the, the, the rules of thumb there. So I'm going to go through each of the techniques briefly. So the first is the interlaminar technique. Um, and, and you can really handle massive disc herniations here. What I'm going to be talking about today is mostly disc herniations. Um, you can also do stenosis. You can also do fusions, a whole variety of things. But disc herniations is really kind of where you get your feet wet. No pun intended with this. So first thing is access. So the first thing that you're going to do, um, excuse me, is um, place a, a very small tubular retractor which is about eight millimeters in diameter, about the size of a dime through a, a similarly sized incision. And you use basically fluoro, um, it doesn't take much fluoro to place yourself right on the trailing edge of the lamina at the level you're approaching. So this is a, a right-sided L5-S1 approach. And you can see that I'm, I'm docked right on the lamina here. There are some sequential dilators and then the, the endoscope goes in. And then what you're gonna do is the, the trailing edge of that lamina is your landmark. So just to get you oriented, cranials to the right, caudals to the left, medials up here and laterals down here. So what we're looking at is the, the trailing edge of the L5 lamina, because it's a right-sided approach. The spinous process is up here off screen and the facet joint is down here. You can see this white stuff is a little bit of the facet capsule. And then ligamentum flavum in the interlaminar window is gonna be right in here. So I just clean off the edge here. And then if you need to, you can make a little hemilaminotomy. So this is a little diamond tip burr. There's a whole variety of burr tips that you can use. Um, and if you need to make a little hemilaminotomy to facilitate access, you can. 
What I have found over time is that, especially at 5.1 with a reasonably sized window, you rarely have to take any bone at all. But I just show this to show um, that you can, certainly for cranially migrated discs or for, for stenosis cases, um, this can be beneficial. Ultimately, what you find is then, then you've got your little hemilaminotomy, similar to how you were doing this uh, if you were to do it open or through a tubular retractor. And then you're going to dock your endoscope down on the ligamentum flavum, which is here. So that's what you can see here. This is the ligamentum flavum. I've just moved caudally a little bit. And this little tool, it's, it's a punch and it, it cuts, but not all the way to the tip. And what you'll see is I thin the ligamentum flavum down. And when the flavum gets very thin, you can see it's kind of gray right here. Um, I kind of slow down and I open the device. It's not sharp at the tip. And I just kind of poke through gently that, that last little membrane. And what happens there is the fluid pressure rushes in and actually retracts the dura away and makes this quite safe. So what you can see is I just push through. Now the fluid is rushing in, the dura is pushed away. Um, and I can open up that, um, that space. Then I just kind of work my way laterally uh, with a kerosin. And this is probably the equivalent of like a three kerosin. Um, and I can bring that rent in the ligamentum flavum all the way laterally toward myself, and which is toward the facet joint. You don't have to take down all the ligamentum flavum. In fact, just that little rent is big enough to get your endoscope through. Um, once you're down, there's, you know, the epidural fat, there's all these, like, there's a membrane there that you've never seen before, at least I'd never had. Um, and you see all this anatomy you've never seen before. But basically, you take down the epidural fat, you can see the traversing nerve root, which is what you're looking at here. Um, and then you can usually see if it's a paracentral disc herniation, it'll be staring at you right there. And the nerve, the traversing root will be stretched over it. I like to free it up first and before kind of retracting the nerve. And then you can do like a preliminary discectomy here, which is, which is what I'm doing here. So you kind of grab that disc herniation. I'll fast forward through this and remove it. So once you've removed it, you can start to try to mobilize that nerve root a little bit more and retract it over. The, the tubular retractor is actually beveled. And so what that allows you to do is use the time like a retractor. And so what you've seen right here is I just retracted that traversing nerve root out of the way medially. And now I'm staring down at the lateral recess and, and even probably all the way to the central canal right here. Um, and, and now I'm circumferentially protected here, um, which allows you to very safely kind of complete your decompression but, but in you know, unique cases, calcified discs, fractures, et cetera, you can very safely burr all the way, you know, very safely underneath the, the um, neural elements, uh, taking what would otherwise be a kind of pucker factor case and, and making it pretty darn straightforward. And this is that rotation move I was showing. So when you first go down, you have the bevel medial. Um, in order to get the, the retractor lateral to the nerve root. And then once you do kind of a preliminary discectomy, you can turn it around, which retracts the nerve roots uh, in the fecal sac, and you can get down and, and clean everything out. When you're done, you kind of confirm adequate decompression, which is a combination of direct visualization, palpation, and then you know I, I also take some x-rays, and I also save the disc material too. Um, and I find that saving that disc material and correlating it, you can see this here, correlating it with what I would expect from the MRI can be helpful in telling me whether I'm done. The other thing is, um, this is the self-proclaimed Derman shadow. So, it, you know, I often get asked, how do you know when you're done? And, and it's really, really apparent um, in these cases. So this is before the discectomy. So what you're looking at is the traversing right S1 nerve root really tented over this disc herniation here. And then this is after I've done the decompression. What you can see is there's a shadow underneath the nerve root. And because of the angled optics, you get almost like a 3D visualization. And you can see that this, this nerve is, is no longer under compression here. So that's the interlaminar technique, a lot easier to kind of wrap your mind around. It's, it's similar to kind of traditional techniques, just using smaller instruments. The transforaminal technique um, is a little bit different um, because it's a, it's a way of viewing the spine that we're not used to seeing, um, but it can be very pow powerful. So we'll kind of go through that technique. 
So the, that, that transfer animal technique starts with targeting and targeting is a little bit more involved um, with this technique. You do it over a wire. And so um, for, for this case, we're gonna be doing a left-sided L3-4 um, decompression. And so what I've done is there is a long flexible spinal needle that I use. And I try to place it just to the medial aspect of the pedicle, not beyond the medial particular line, and then hitting kind of the back of the vertebral body here or the junction of where the pedicle meets the back of the vertebral body. You don't wanna dock in the disc. So kind of earlier iterations of endoscopy, lumbar endoscopy were inside out procedures where you just kind of docked in the disc and then jammed your camera into the disc and then kind of blindly grabbed stuff out um, where this is really epidural surgery. So you don't need to inject dye to differentiate things. Um, you can, you're in the epidural space and you can see the neural elements. Um, but, but this is where you want to start. Once your needle's down, you place a flexible guide wire over it, make a little incision. And then there's some sequential dilators that go down. Um, and these are really kind of dilating the soft tissue, dilating the fascia, because the fascial, you can't really cut the fascia with the knife. It's, it's way far away. So you're dilating through it. And then there are some sequential reamers that you can use to basically do a foraminoplasty. And the important thing here is with these reamers and this technique, you're not taking down the facet joint. You're just taking down a little bit of the undersurface, the ventral non-articular surface of the SAP to create some space for the endoscope and the working cannula. And there's actually a nice biomechanical study out there showing that, you know, if we're talking about foraminal stenosis, that if you're going on a, from a transforaminal endoscopic approach, you can actually increase the dimensions of the foramen substantially more than if you're going kind of inside out and it results in no increased um, motion. So you're not destabilizing the spine, unlike if you're doing kind of a more traditional foramenotomy. So once you've done your reaming, you place your tubular retractor, which for these transforaminal cases is a little bit smaller, it's about seven degrees excuse me, seven millimeters, um, and then your endoscope goes inside. And what you're looking at, so again, this is a left-sided L3-4 example. What you're looking for is this arch, which is the pedicle of the caudal, the superior aspect of the caudal pedicle. So in this case, this would be the L4 pedicle, the top of the pedicle arching up into the SAP. And that's kind of your, your landmark basically. And if you know where that is, you can see this is the traversing nerve root. This is the disc space, you know, ahead of you is the canal, but right here is the foramen and behind you is the uh, far lateral region. And this is one of my cases here. You can see me just kind of showing this arch starting with the top of the pedicle arching over and then the uh, exiting nerve root with the DRG is, is within this kind of fatty and vascular structure. And this is what it looks like, say you're doing a paracentral disc herniation. Um, when you first get down, um, there's basically just disc everywhere because you're looking outside in into the lateral recess. And what I do is I just very slowly take piece by piece of that disc herniation um, and it that, that disc herniation is deflecting typically the traversing nerve root dorsally. And so by, by decompressing it slowly, that nerve root starts to fall down into place. And that's what you're seeing here. So at first, I couldn't see anything, just disc everywhere. And then the, the nerve starts to come down into, into my view as I have debulked that paracentral disc herniation. And then by the time I'm done, you can see nice space underneath the nerve. Um, and I'm happy uh, with my decompression. And you can see at the end of the case, I always put a, a ball tip as far as I can see, just to prove to myself that I'm everywhere where I think I am. And you can see in this case, I could directly visualize, not in this view here, but I could directly visualize all the way to the midline. Um, which is really a really great tool. And you can even see beyond the midline um, in certain cases. The other cool thing is because the angles, the optics are angled. So for a transforaminal scope, I use a 30 degree scope. You can look around corners and you can look back toward yourself, which is like a real out of body experience. So for working in the foraminal and far lateral regions, it can be helpful to turn the scope over and look back towards you. And that's what this, this move that you see here. And, and here's an example here from one of my cases. Initially, I was looking medial and we're gonna turn up and over. This is the exiting nerve root, um, kind of encased in, 
and some fat and some tissue, but now we're looking laterally. And so now this is the exiting nerve root. This is the hypotenuse of Camden's triangle. Cranials over here, caudals over here. This is the disc space. And, and you can really work in the, in the foraminal and even far lateral regions very nicely. And obviously decreases the morbidity uh, compared to more traditional techniques. So there is a learning curve to this. Um, and so the question is, okay, Dermot, if it's so great, why isn't everyone doing it? And it's because it takes some time to learn how to do this. The important thing to me, and I learned this as an attending, not in my training, was that the learning curve is much more about time than it is about safety or effectiveness. Um, and so this is um, a study, a transferaminal study, just showing that initial cases were very slow, um, and then the surgeon got progressively faster, um, but they were safe and effective. And Dr. Hofstetter and I have just published our personal learning curves for endoscopic cervical surgery and found similar things that yes, we were slower at first, um, but we were able to accomplish the goals of surgery safely. I always recommend that people start with easy cases first. So that's um, soft pathology in the lumbar spine for a transferaminal approach that's in the foramen at L4, 5 and above for an interlaminar approach that's paracentral discs at 5, 1, because by the time you get down, you're looking right at this stuff. And then you just gradually tackle harder stuff. So transferaminals at L5, S1, a little bit harder because the pelvis is in the way, migrated discs, osseous and, and central stenosis, and then you know cervical cases, thoracic cases, fusions. Uh, where, where this stuff can also really shine. So now I have some cases. Before I go into any cases, any questions from anyone? Hey, Peter. Do you have a picture of the instrument that you use to take down the ligamental plate? Because I think that is a big, big advancement because the fact that it doesn't cut at the tip protects you as you're thinning out whatever you're biting. Yes, um, I agree. And I've even thought about using it in the infrequent, you know, non-endoscopic cases that I do now. Um, but, but I can show it to you uh, in the, uh, at the hospital on Thursday or something, but you can see it there. It's, 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 it's like a scissor almost, but it doesn't cut quite to the tip. It cuts like a millimeter shy of the tip there. Um, and, 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 you know, it's interesting. I wonder why they don't make the regular instruments, the regular open instruments, because that would save a lot of uh, nerve bites. Not that it happens often, but for the occasional one, that if it didn't bite to the very tip, then you have a, a good chance you're not going to injure anything. Because as you said, it acts as a retractor. And, and that, I think, is very clever. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's scary when you're first using it. Um, but knock wood, I, I haven't had a derotomy. And, you know, I've done, as you know, many, many cases, hundreds of cases. Um, the other thing I like about the endoscope is, you know, you, you're, you can't really have an assistant, right? But the fluid pressure is like your assistant and it helps kind of retract things out of the way. So how much is the fluid pressure? Um, we keep it, you know, I don't even know what the setting is. I would have to, I would have to look at our, it's all set on the thing, but it's below diastolic. I think we try to keep it like half of diastolic or something like that. Okay. So it really does indent the door once you have that opening. Oh yeah. It pushes it out of the way. And Peter, before you go on, there was one other question from uh, one of the um, the pa uh, uh, I uh, said, panelists. How many how yeah. many cases for the true learning curve? So right. it depends on what you read, um, but most papers would say that if you're looking at lumbar discectomy, that the learning curve you kind of plateau or stabilize at around 25 cases. Um, so, you know, when you're first starting, it takes a long time to do these. And in fact, my first endoscopic discectomy, which is something I could have done in 45 minutes or less through a tube, took me three and a half hours. Um, now, you rapidly get a lot faster and everything went well during that case and the patient got better. But you just got to kind of budget time when you're first starting. And, and this is why, um, you know, there is a hurdle to getting started, but it's worth it. And I'll show you some cases why. Peter, can I just ask you, probably the, the two things I think people worry about the most are, um, do you ever get epidural bleeding that obscures your view and you can't control? And what do you do if you punch through and get a dural tear? Yes, thank you. Common concern. So epidural bleeding, there are a variety of techniques you can use uh, to limit it. Um, one thing in general, in general, what you try to do is increase the local fluid pressure near the bleeder, right? Um, and so what you can do is advance your scope toward the bleeder. And because the fluid comes out of the tip of the scope, 
Um, sometimes that's enough to slow it down. You can also occlude the outflow valve of the um, endoscope, which again, temporarily increases the pressure there. Um, sometimes I'll use like a dilute thrombin solution um, if you if there's a pernicious bleeder that you can't get to. Oh, and by the way, there's a there's like a bipolar um, device that you can use to coagulate bleeders. Um, and then, you know, you can also use topical hemostatic agents too. The problem with those is they expand. Uh, and so you do have to evacuate them because there's no dead space here. And so you worry about those causing compression after surgery. Um, but, but other than that, you know, I have not had, you know, post-operative hematomas or anything like that. I, I do make sure obviously at the end of the case that, that there's no active bleeding, um, and no drain or anything. You know, these patients are mostly home in an hour and a half after surgery. And then durotomy, great question. That's a, that's a big source of anxiety, especially when you're first starting. Um, the, the good news about durotomies with endoscopic spine surgery is that while they look humongous on your screen, and when you first see your first one, you want to vomit into your mask because you're so scared. If you like take a deep breath, you realize that most of them are like two millimeters. They're really small. It's just way magnified. And because there's no dead space, um, the experience of most of the endoscopic high volume surgeons and talking to everyone is that, that it's infrequent to have post-operative symptoms. There, there are some surgeons that will just leave them alone. I can't kind of bring myself to do that. What I've been doing is a, um, an in, a collagen matrix inlay graft. So I cut a little piece of collagen matrix. Um, you know, there's different brands or whatever, but you can put it in. I put it into the dural defect um, and the CSF pressure pushes it back against the defect, like plugging a tire or something. Um, and, and no, it's, I can't imagine it's watertight, but what it does do is it prevents herniation of the nerve roots and post-operative radiculitis. Um, so I do that, you know, some people will squirt glue in there, but I get worried about that expanding. But even with a, with a Duragen inlay graft, I'll mobilize them in the PACU. And as long as they don't have symptoms, I send them home right like I normally would um, and, and haven't had kind of persistent issues there. So um, Peter, will you put a little plug in of the Duragen in a two millimeter or does it have to be bigger than that? Because that's kind of small to put a plug through. Um, no, even if it's like two, two, three millimeters, you know, I use my little micro pituitary and take that piece and, and put it in there. And then there's like a little nerve hook that I'll do to kind of, kind of maneuver it into that area. Obviously, if you've got a big durotomy, I mean, then you've got to, you convert to open and, and fix it primarily. Great. Thank you, Peter. All right. So, so some cases here. So this is one of like my first 10 endoscopic cases. So this was a 29 year old gentleman uh, who came to me with right L5 radicular pain and weakness. And um, I don't think we have any fellows here, so I'll, I'll just go through these. Um, but what you can see is maybe some transitional anatomy, but um, you know, no, no deformity. And what he had was a right-sided foraminal and really far lateral disc herniation at L5S1 here. Um, and and had, he saw me as a second or maybe a third opinion, I think a third opinion. So one, one surgeon had offered him a T-lift, which, which I think is not unreasonable given the situation. Another surgeon had offered him an A-lift um, with, I think with, I don't remember posterior instrumentation or what, but the, the thought was obviously it's very difficult to access this area without sacrificing this facet joint. Um, and he had a relatively narrow pelvis. So you can see his iliac wing was here and the space between that and the facet joint, the sacral alo is very limited. Um, and so before endoscopy, the way that I would do these was with a tubular retractor like a metrics tube or whatever. Um, but even with that, his anatomy would, it would have made it very challenging to get, you know, a 16 or 18 millimeter tube in, in this space here. Um, so obviously this is an endoscopic talk. So what I did was uh, an endoscopic decompression, but this is really a wonderful place where you can do an outside in transforaminal uh, decompression. And I was able to get that disc herniation out. And this was kind of his vast leg score. Um, this is the disc material, obviously. Um, and, you know, he went to from six out of 10. And then at, at two week follow up, when I saw him back, he was at two out of 10 and then went all the way down. And his strength rebounded rather rapidly, too. Um, and so, again, this was one of my early cases. And I, this is when I was like, wow, not only is this like a really small incision and he goes home really quick and doesn't take narcotics, 
but it's really cool that I could fundamentally change the surgery that this young man was going to need. Any thoughts on that? So, so Peter, um, now, if he had a deep set L5S1, it would have been more problematic because you basically have the straight endoscope and not curved ones. Is that right? Um, I think for a foraminal disc and a far lateral, you can always get there at 5.1. The problem is if if it's, you know, you're never going to be able to, well, never. It's much more difficult to get a paracentral disc herniation from a transforaminal approach at L5S1 um, or a central disc herniation. But fortunately, you know, 5.1 big inner laminar window. So for those pathologies, that's where I would go inner laminar. Does that make sense? Yeah. Peter, so is it a no-go that nobody's working on a curved... Uh endoscope and the curved instruments, because I remember that some of the uh, different percutaneous techniques that we had years ago, like the, uh, oh, I forget the surgical dynamics, which was like a little uh, chomper, a little Pac-Man eater. They had some curved ones that let you get into L5S1 really easily, and you can get central disc herniations and the like. Huh. Yeah, that would be for all, for all you historians, that was called the nucleotone. Nucleotone. Yes. Okay, but but... Okay, that's right. So here, here's another case. Again, another early one. I wanted to start with early cases so people would, could see that, like, you know, it's not, it's not terribly difficult. You can do these things early on. So this is a 66 year old lady with an acute left L4 radiculopathy, uh, and what you could see is she, she has some transitional anatomy too. Um, but what I'm calling is, uh, you know, this the L4-5 disc space here, and she has a disc herniation in the foramen here, um, and which was causing her symptoms. Now, she obviously had this scoliosis, um, but she was a super active lady and didn't complain of a lot of back pain and was like a crossfitter um, and just had this radiculopathy. And so obviously, you know, my thought was, can I get in there? Can I clean this out? without destabilizing her, um, without fusing her, because you know, even if I was gonna do a one level fusion here, you might worry about doing that right next to her curvature and scoliosis um, and, and whether that would predispose her to additional problems down the line. So you know, this was another good case to go transforaminal um, where I went outside in, didn't disrupt the facet joint at all, uh, was able to remove that disc material. You can see this is the exiting nerve root coming across. Um, looking ahead of us would be into the canal, uh, obligatory thumbs up dressing shot. And then similar, she did, she did really, really well. And you can see this was in September of 2020. Um, and she continues to do really well. She's like one, one of my number one fans posts on my social media and stuff. So, um, you know, ODI of 48, um, you know, a lot of pain and, and just went down back to doing all the things that she wanted to do. Hey. Hey, Peter, go back to your x-ray where you showed the docking. Did you have it docked high or would you rather have it a little bit lower? Great question. Thank you. So I always start docking down here on that point where, uh, where I mentioned during the technique part, because that's the safest place far away from the nerve. But this herniation had migrated all the way up to the pedicle above. Um, and so what I would do is, what I do is, you know, I, this down here at the bottom of the frame, it is kind of my home base. And then I'll, I'll work my way up and sweep and, and can remove that disc herniation. But I don't like to hang out here any longer than I have to. So, you know, I'll go up and work for 30 seconds and then I'll give the DRG a break. Um, because if you if you lever too hard on this, you're pushing the DRG against the pedicle. Right. And, and people can get um, postoperative DRG symptoms. Thanks. Um, all right. Another case. So this is, I think this was a more recent case. So this is a 73 year old gentleman who came to me uh, with three months of right anterior thigh pain. Um, and, and, you know, what you can see is, you know, maybe he doesn't have a ton of lumbar lordosis and, and maybe you could talk yourself into doing a uh, giant deformity surgery on this guy, but he was doing well until his right anterior thigh pain three months ago. And what you can see is he's a big kind of central right paracentral disc herniation at, at L2-3. Um, which is not an easy case uh, to decompress. You know, his his facet joints are are kind of medium uh, sagittally oriented. There's not a big interpedicular space, and so you know, decompressing this is hard, even if you do a full lamy. 
um, in order to kind of get things over safely without destabilizing him. So surprise, surprise. Peter, yeah. Peter, why don't you just ask the panelists? Yeah, okay. What, well, how would you, what would you guys do in, in, in real life? Let's see, who do we have on there? Um, Mike Heisey, what would you do? Man, you're going to make me stop walking on my treadmill. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I'm, assuming I can't send him to Peter and have him fix it correctly, I, I would do a small laminotomy on the right side, remove the ligament and play them, take probably uh -huh. a third of the facet, but that I would have to take a third of the facet to get that out, though. But that's what I do. I, I yeah. probably wouldn't do a big deformity operation. I just do the, the discectomy. And and really, before Peter came in the group, I think we all agreed we'd do the same thing. And as he said, this is a hard case because you have to get wide enough before you begin to, you know, retract the fecal sac. Otherwise, you end up with, you know, some type of neurologic deficit. Question. I, I did maybe I didn't hear all the clinical. Was there any back pain associated with this, or was this all leg pain? I was primarily leg pain. Now, don't you think in the general spine community, the surgeon would ask the patient, are you having any back pain? And the patient would say, yeah, I'm having some back pain. And nine out of 10 surgeons in the general spine community would give this guy a fusion. I wouldn't be surprised. You're probably right. It, yeah, it's I mean, a lot easier to fix with a fusion if you don't know how to do it endoscopically. Right. And, and, and I think that's, that's how, you know, you know, what Peter's kind of lecturing on tonight is, you know, it's a game changer because we would, frankly, I would do a bilateral decompression on this guy, do a partial facetectomy to get that big disc. Whereas the, the endoscopics surgeons could do this with taking no bone and still taking the fragment out. And like, like Peter said, be home in an hour. I mean, I think it's a game changer. Especially for, you know, well, really for anyone, but, you know, this 73 year old guy is not, you know, depending on his physiologic age, you, you prefer not to fuse them if you can. No, Rand Randy, but, Davis, uh, Randy Davis said he disagrees that back pain gets better at decompression. It, and, and I agree with you. I'm just saying within the community, people use that less sophisticated surgeons use it as an indication for fusion because of back pain. I, Randy, I agree with you 100% that you remove that fragment off the fecal sac, you're going to, you're going to alleviate the minor amount of back pain with the major amount of back of leg pain. So yes. And those folks that would recommend diffusion for this patient because the discs are abnormal above and below are just setting them up for failure. But go ahead, Peter. Yeah. They're setting them up for the next operation, which is, yes. You know, if we're being a real, real cynic about it, that's what they're doing. Indeed. Um, and so, you know, I went transfer animal on this one, which is really nice because I didn't have to take any bone whatsoever. Um, and you can see, you know, just where I was able to get. And, and this never gets old to me. I, I was teaching a lab over the weekend and just being able to see all the way to the other side, contralateral pedicle through the ventral epidural space is just such a cool it's the only way you can be in that place in the spine. Um, you know, any, there's no other way that I'm aware of. Um, and, and it's just so, so minimally invasive. So, you know, this is the disc material that came out. He immediately felt, you know, dramatically better. And, and he's continued to do very well since then. Hey, Peter. So you said that you put the scope in um, epidurally outside the annulus. So that's eight millimeters. And he didn't have a whole lot of space there. Were you a little concerned that you were causing a little pressure on the remainder of the decompressed fecal sac or not? Yes. Good, good question. So, so th this is splitting hairs, but this one's a little bit smaller. It's seven millimeters, this scope, the transfer. Okay. But um, I, the kind of my technique was I started docking, not all the way that far. So I docked like in the foramen and I just kind of reached forward. I didn't have my whole working cannula in there with my instruments and, and got out most of this disc herniation to give him, you know, a decompression um, enough that I could then safely advance in um, without worrying about iatrogenic nerve compression. Um, if somebody had severe, severe canal stenosis from, you know, dorsal pathology, so facet overgrowth, ligamentum overgrowth, um, 
and a, and a herniation, I probably would actually go dorsally. I'd go interlaminar because they need a, a dorsal decompression as well. Does that make Great. sense? Nice job. All right. This is a cool one. I did this one uh, a couple months ago. And in fact, I think I chatted with some of you guys about this case. So this is a 73 year old lady, um, actually the mother of a, a local interventional pain doctor with a, acute left anterior thigh pain. Um, she had a history of two prior L5S1 microdiscectomies, apparently. Um, but you can see, and I'll show you, that she's autofused here at L5S1. Um, she also had a basi vertebral nerve ablation, um, which resulted in some interesting kind of artifact in her bone. And at first I didn't, I didn't realize she'd had that procedure and I wasn't really sure what was going on there. But the important thing to see here, and, and I don't want to give away the punchline, but she does have a little bit of a spondy here at this L3-4 level. So you don't really see it here, but you see it here. It's relatively subtle, but it's there. And you could justify, justify calling this a mobile spondylolisthesis. Here's what the MRI showed at that level. She had a disc extrusion on the left side, which corresponded with, you know, the distribution of her symptoms. Um, and it was cranially migrated behind the vertebral body. Um, and here you can see on the, on the CT scan that she's fused here. Um, and she's a small lady. So, um, you know, the, her anatomy um, was, was, was tight and, and very sagely oriented. So maybe I'll pull the audience again. So this is a nuanced case. So, so what would you do here and, and what is your thought process? Peter, go back and show the flexion film again. I think, again, the general spine community who are looking to try to do the most surgery for each potential diagnosis would fuse that. I think that that's overkill, particularly pretend, you know, particularly pertaining to the symptoms. So, I mean, I, I know you're, you're, bait, you're baiting us to say, oh, it has to have a fusion, but no, it doesn't have to have a fusion. And well, the interesting thing about a fusion is if you, and she's auto fused at this level. So it's not even fusing one level. If you fuse this level, I mean, you're probably gonna have to fuse this intervening level as well. So it goes from a, either a small thing or a pretty big thing. Well, you know, Peter, this is an interesting case because, you know, most people would say if you have to violate the disc space, that the last vestige of stabilization for the patient who already has some, you know, facet abnormality. And yeah, the common thing would be, okay, you're going to take the disc out. You're going to have to do a fusion. So you're going to show us that you didn't have to, which is, which is great. At least so far. And I, Obviously, what I did with an endoscopic discectomy on this lady, but I counseled her that, like, hey, we'll give this a try. We don't burn any bridges. And if you reherniate or, you know, you have worse instability or whatever else, we can always do more. Um, but, you know, she was acutely uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable. And, you know, it was worth a try. And so far, so good. So what I did on this one, I actually went interlaminar. Because of the degree of the cranial migration, a little bit hard to turn that corner and look that far north. Um, and so I did a interlaminar approach, which allowed me to make only a very, very small hemilaminotomy. In fact, you can see the facet joint here um, is totally intact. I, I totally left that alone. Just a small enough hemilaminotomy to get my scope in. And then you can really see how far I can see. So I can you know, get down to the pedicle here and the pedicle above. And so this is me looking up and removing that disc herniation. And then this is after I'm done with my decompression, you can see that that left-sided nerve root in the fecal sac is, is all completely opened up. And this is obviously the, the disc material. Yeah, I see the shadow. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I thought that was a, you know, a big win for team you know, avoid the fusion. Um, you know, we'll see what the future holds, but but at least for the time being, she's comfortable and, and happy and, and moved on with her life. Peter, right. how far out is she now? You know, I think she's like two or three months out now. Okay. 
the the other thing is um to to the point about you know making an annulotomy and and further destabilizing her you know this was mostly an extrusion so in keeping with that i i was very careful to do very minimal you know in the disc or even at the disc space so i just kind of took out the extruded fragments um and and you know hopefully time will tell she'll continue to do well by the way, if anyone is, is looking to see what basi vertebral nerve ablation looks like on an MRI, um, <laughs> it, it, it looks like this. Um, at first, I was like, oh, my gosh, does this woman have TB or something something horrible? But um, ask about basi vertebral nerve ablation. Wow. Was that before or after auto, she got it her It looks fused. like it's auto-fused. Yeah, I think yeah. it auto-fused. It, it actually auto-fused, and then, and then they did it. Um, and yeah. then they did it? On a fused level, yeah. Oh, that goes along with Dr. Blumenthal's idea about everybody maximizing their surgery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Also goes along with being married to a pain management doc or mother of a pain management doc. No comment. No. Um, so here, here's another case. So, um, oh, this was a good one. This one has been years. So I've lots of follow up on this one. 34 year old guy, acute left L5 radiculopathy and weakness. Oh, there's some chats here. Um, Maybe I'll, maybe I'll look through these real quick. Um, somebody else was well, gonna do a decompression alone. They didn't wanna do a fusion. Drains, I do not use drains in these procedures. I'm very anal about making sure that everything's dry before I leave. And these patients go home you know, within 90 minutes usually. So um, I, don't, I don't use a drain. How much conservative management uh, for acute symptoms? My indications are for surgery, are completely unchanged with this. So I still, you know, strongly prefer that patients have physical therapy. You know, we do NSAIDs if, if it's allowable, we'll do injections. Um, and only if they fail all of that stuff, do I think about surgery? So it doesn't change my threshold for doing surgery. It's just, you know, what surgery do I do? Okay, so um, back to our case. So our 34 year old guy um, left L5, pain and weakness, a very clear L5 radiculopathy. He'd had a history of two prior left L4 to S1 microdiscectomies. So two prior. Um, one was 15 years ago, and then the other was one year ago. And he'd done well after both, but he'd only gotten one year out of the most recent. Um, super active, former college football player um, who wanted to avoid a fusion at all costs. Um, what you can see here, um, you know, this is the four five level. This is five one. Um, this is T two, and then this is T one post contrast. And at four five, there was there's clearly a new fragment there. At five one, at first you look at it, and it seems like it, but most of it ended up enhancing. Um, and so I was pretty confident his symptoms were coming from this four five level um, between the MRI and the fact that he traced out like a perfect L5 distribution. Now, this I think is going to be an interesting one, um, especially for kind of the, the arthroplasty mavens uh, in our practice. So the other thing is this is a very large guy, not really like obese, but a very large guy um, probably would not pass the guy or forearm test. Um, but maybe in the vicinity. Um, so, so what are your, what are your all's thoughts on this one? Hmm. You know, Peter, you know, we do a lot of Arthur plates for recurrent discs, but if he's too big, um, and we have somebody like you that's willing to tackle these recurrent discs, then go for it. <laughs> How about you, Scott? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on the same page. I mean, I mean, BMI these days, depending on where they carry their weight, you know, the, that 35 to 40 BMI is a, is a risky anterior that I know a lot of people will tackle. But, you know, I, I think if you can do it endoscopically, I think it's worth a, another try. If it doesn't work, then you got to do something bigger, but go for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I'd actually, I think I might've showed this to you guys at the time as well. So I had a long conversation, super educated, very smart guy. And he really wanted to avoid a fusion. It was met about whether disc replacement was going to be a possibility. Um, and so, you know, we ended up doing a, a revision, revision discectomy, um, even though he knew that, you know, the traditional thing is three strikes you're out. He, he was willing to give it a try. Um, 
and and that's just what I did. So I did the the L45 level only on the left side. Um, let's see if this is video. You can see I was able to remove that disc herniation. Um, you know, early on, I was very um, intimidated by these cases. So going transferaminal um, to access pathology when there had been a previous typical microdiscectomy, but actually they're not that bad. This is way better way at L4, 5 and above to do a revision discectomy. One, because you don't have to take any more bone. And then two, because you're not traversing that same scar plane again. And, and actually what I've found is in some cases, they're sometimes easier because all the epidurals have already been coagulated. So it doesn't bleed as much. Um, and then this is just an idea. This is looking into the canal. This is the traversing nerve root. And, and you can see that I can feel everywhere. Um, and, and he was adequately decompressed. Um, you know, surgery took an hour and 10 minutes. He left after two hours. He did extremely well. He's over two years out now and, and continues to do well. Um, and this, he texted me from home the day of surgery. He can't believe how good he feels. The endoscopic technique is a real game changer, which is really cool because this is a guy who's had, he'd had an open microdisc, he'd had a tubular microdisc, and he had an endoscopic discectomy. Um, and, and, you know, not many people have the ability to compare all of those things. Um, and who knows what the, what the future holds. And maybe he'll need a disc replacement and he'll be slimmed down a little bit. But the nice thing is I haven't destabilized his facet joint. So he's no, he's no less a candidate now than he was before my surgery. Hey, Peter, there was a couple questions on the chat. You want to go through them? Sure. Thank you. All right. Do I recommend fixation for this case? Um, no. Um, you know, we had talked about it. I talked to the patient and he did not want to undergo any sort of instrumentation or fusion. Um, he understood the risks of, you know, reherniation, et cetera. And he felt like even if this buys him some time, then, then that's worthwhile. Now, limit to the number of recurrent discs. I mean, usually I subscribe to the three strikes you're out kind of rule. Um, that, you know, at the third time you either get a disc replacement or a fusion, depending on your anatomy there. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's all a conversation that you have with the patient. But, you know, Peter, with the endoscopic technique, it really changes that whole paradigm because, you know, the typical thing, whether it's two, one recurrent, two recurrent, three recurrent. Um, but here you have a technique, as you said, you're not going through the scar. It's actually a little easier than you thought initially, which, you know, I don't find really surprising considering you're going through a virgin plane. Yeah. So, it, you know, when you think about it, it's really not a bad way to go. Yeah. And, you know, I never want to. It's actually an excellent way to go. And I don't want to minimize surgery. You know, I take this seriously. It is an operation. But in many ways, if you're willing to have an injection, why not at least try this? Um, and, and so like, you know, I think it's worth a try. If it fails, then, then you can always do something more. You haven't, you haven't burnt any bridges. Um, this was an interesting case. This was a 56 year old lady, a little bit different from our disc herniation um, cases we've been doing so far. This is a 56 year old lady who had had an, who had a, uh, an a lift, um, actually had a fall, had an a lift uh, and long story short, had broken off the back of her L5 vertebral body here. Um, and it was pushing into the lateral recess and the foraminal area. Um, and, and, you know, she was having associated radiculopathy, tried non-operative management for several months, um, and then ultimately decided, hey, we should take care of this. Um, you certainly could do an open decompression, et cetera. There's nothing wrong about that. Um, but this did kind of go underneath the, the fecal sac. And, and, you know, that would be kind of somewhat harrowing to either nibble or pull that out or burr that out, et cetera. Um, so for this one, I went interlaminar. Um, and what I did, you can see my, my little hemilaminotomy here that I made. Um, and because you can do that 180 degree turn move with the beveled um, working cannula, I was able to completely exclude the neural element and then just burr out that, that piece of bone there. And so you can see this is the post-op uh, CT showing that it's completely gone. And then this was kind of cool. It's like a party trick. This was the A-lift cage. So it's a tie-coated tie peak A-lift cage um, with the traversing nerve root going over it. And, and you know, I was, I was confident that I completely kind of decompressed that area. Can I ask a question? 
Yes, sir. So patient had previous surgery, had a fall, broke a piece of hard tissue into the neuroforamen, and you mentioned the patient failed non-operative care. I mean, how many people would wait to decompress that? Now, I mean, obviously you did it very elegantly, which, you know, obviously that's why we're here, but, you know, someone someone has a hard fragment, you know, bony fragment in the neuroforamen from a trauma. There's really not, I don't know. I mean, does, does anybody like want to try anything more than just one selective nerve block before you go back in and reoperate on this person? She didn't have weakness, so I, I don't think there was, you know, I think it was fair to do, um, but I don't disagree either. It would not have been wrong to go back immediately. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, a, that's a pretty obvious hard tissue impingement on a nerve root. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I hate to sound like someone who wouldn't try non-operative treatment, but that's not kind of a non-operative treatment kind of scenario, I think, except for maybe one injection to give it a try, but maybe not. So that, that, that hey, actually, Peter, Peter, uh, Peter, before you leave that case, can you go back to the endoscopic page and can you outline the nerve root? Is the nerve root going from oh, yeah, I'm sorry. to step o'clock? Yeah. So, so the, the traversing um, right-sided, let me pause it here. Sorry, this stuff's getting in the way. Uh, the traversing nerve root. So let me get you oriented. So we're on the right side. Medial's up here, okay. lateral's down here, the head's over here, the, the, the feet are down here. This is the traversing um, S1 nerve root. And, and the exiting nerve root is, is, this is bone, but it's underneath this bone here. Okay, and, so and that's the nerve root that was compressed. That's the, the L5 root? Correct, the, the L5 and, and a little bit of S1. It did go, it did go you know, underneath S1 too. Okay. I mean, it really goes to show you know, the extent of what you can do with, with the technique that you've described tonight, with the endoscopic technique. I mean, because 99% of the spine world would say, oh, I mean, we got to go in there and take that frag, you know, and take that hard tissue, bony spicule out. And to be able to do that with much less, you know, ancillary tissue damage, it's a kind of a game changer. Yeah, and, and, and much less, like I did a big giant kind of, the corollary to this is a big calcified disc. I did a big calcified disc a few weeks ago. And like, it's like a total relaxed case, you know, I just kind of burn it out, no, no real concerns there. So I thought this was a, a cool example. Peter, I, I, this, the technique has been around for 15 or 20 years, you know, kind of puttering around in the US and picked up more, a little bit more in Asia. And just in the last few years, you know, it, it's gained a huge amount of traction. Um, it, is it because the, the instrumentation is better, that the equipment's better? Is it because we're, you know, we're smarter or that younger guys like you are more three-dimensionally oriented? And, and we're able to pick it up quicker. What do you think that is? I think it's a combination of factors. I think that one is the optics and the instrumentation has gotten sufficiently good that we're no, it's no longer blind surgery. It's no longer percutaneous surgery. You're not plunging into the disc and just grabbing stuff. You're really seeing everything. And, and I think that's what's allowed it to kind of start to shift more into the mainstream. Um, and, and part of that's the camera, part of that's the screen, and part of that's the instruments. Um, and then, you know, I think on the other side is on the, the reimbursement side of things, which is before it was, you, you couldn't get insurance to approve these things. And now it's, it's less of an issue. So that's allowed for more, you know, adoption of this. And, and Peter, you, you know, and I tell the story about how I trained with Camden and it was like doing the old fashioned knee arthroscopy. You looked in and then you took the scope out, then you put your instrument in blindly and you pulled some stuff out. You went back to look. So it's like night and day with the optics, the instrumentation and, and what we're doing today or what you're doing today that we did, couldn't even dream of doing before. Yeah. And, you know, before you were really sacrificing visualization, now I feel like the visualization is better. Like I can see stuff I would never have seen before. Well, um, listen, you, your pictures are beautiful and just the, they're so instructive and I have a much better feel uh, now than, you know, and I know you've been doing it for many years with us, but it really makes a big difference. And I hope the, all the participants and those online have uh, appreciated all the wonderful pictures you're showing. 
Let me skip ahead because there's one I want to show. This is just to give the punchline here. This is a lytic spondy with a caudally migrated disc at four or five, the level above. Um, and, and you might be inclined to have to do a fusion here because if you do a hemilaminotomy, maybe you destabilize um, you know, the, the, the level below. But I was able to go transferaminal, reach down um, and grab that disc herniation out of there. Oh, this is um, this is a big, massive. Just to show the the size of the herniations you can get, this is a big, massive right pair central herniation of five one migrated all the way up to four five, and I was able to get there. I did have to do. I went interlaminar. I did use the drill to make a hemilaminotomy. Um, you can see this is the top of the ligamentum flavum starting to peter out, but you can see I could I could get all the way up to the disc face above and and all the way below the pedicle below through a single uh, eight millimeter incision. Pretty cool. And this is this is her post-op incision, uh, and this is you know just to show you the the, the quality of what you see here. Um, you know they're really beautiful images, and this is a, a big old herniation here. And then um, what I wanted to show was this. So um, this is a cervical case. We talked a lot about lumbar, but you know that's not that's just the start of the story. You know you can do thoracic, you can do cervical, and I feel like especially in cervical. And thoracic too, this is where endoscopy really shines, where, you know, the difference between the open option and the endoscopic option is really a lot different. So this is a 44-year-old gentleman with acute left C8 pain and weakness, and this left-sided disc herniation at C71, and a pretty thick, short neck. Um, so, so difficult to get to going from the front. And in the interest of time, I just want to show what I did. I did an endoscopic posterior cervical foraminotomy through, again, an eight millimeter incision, just to show you what I see and get you oriented. So this is his head. This is his feet. This is the left side, C7 lamina, T1. This is the facet joint, so the interlaminar V. Um, and so I'm just taking that that first you start by taking down the IAP of C7, just like if you did this open, but just smaller tools. This is the uh, T1 SAP. So that's the next thing there. And so you take that, you burr it, and then you can use a kerosene to take the last little bits out. And what you see underneath is a really beautiful view. So this is the fecal sac and the left C8 nerve root coming off. Here's the T1 pedicle on the left. And, and you can see if it's just stenosis, you can just unroof it. But if it's a disc herniation, you can actually reach anterior and remove these disc herniations very nicely. <laughs> now, if they go substantially underneath the fecal sac, centrally, you can't really retract, obviously, the cord. Um, but for foraminal pathology, um, this is a great solution to this problem. And so this is just me demonstrating kind of the decompression. Um, and you can look out back toward yourself. And it's really cool to be able to see, you know, out the frame and you can see the pedicle above and below and be sure that you're done with your decompression. This is just, there, there we go. This was just a different case, but it's really cool. You can see all the way out the foramen um, and you can get all the way to the pedicle above, the pedicle below, out the foramen, and this is what they're left with. So he, he did great, complete resolution of his symptoms and, and continues to do well. This was about, I think, a year and a half ago. And then these are um, a CT and an MRI of different patients, but people who have had to get imaging for something else at some point, and I get to check my work. And so you can really see that you're able to open up that foramen to the lateral border of the pedicle um, without you know, destabilizing the facet joint. They still have the vast majority of their facet joint there. So that's the conclusion um, here. I think we're pretty much right on time. I, I just wanted to say that you know, there's certainly a learning curve to this. Um, but anyone that's dedicated to doing it can do it safely and get over that learning curve and go from looking at, you know, this red screen of, of doom to really crisp, beautiful images of places that you've never otherwise been. Well, Peter, that was terrific. I think it was eye-opening and, and very instructional, especially for the older docs on the uh, online here. But it just shows you what you can do. And I really think that if you know, if people watch videos and they do the labs, I think the learning curve can be shortened, especially, you know, those people that are more facile with the instrumentation and maybe the younger generation, like your generation, who's very good with video games. But uh, this is great. And I will just tell everybody that Peter's taught 
took this on himself and he really taught himself by going to a lot of different meetings. And I have to say that most of the docs in our practice refer him these, you know, slam dunk cases that we otherwise would normally do in an open fashion. And we've been real, real happy. And uh, it's really been an asset. And I'm sorry that uh, I'm, I'm not as young as Peter. I probably would take it up myself because it really is a great technique. And Peter, thank you for, for carrying the torch and, and pushing this forward. Well, thank hey, you. Let for me just add, Rick. Thanks for supporting me, everybody. Great well, let me just add, Rick. Peter. Thank you. Refer to him or go to him when you've got your own disc herniation, uh, which I did my own self. <laughs> well, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you, Peter. And thank you, everybody else. Don't forget to uh, get claim your credits. Good job, Peter. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Linda. Thank, thank you. See you. Excellent. Side.